talk about this attack in Moscow. A Russian president, Vladimir Putin, says all four gunmen who carried out a deadly attack at the PAC concert venue in Moscow have been arrested. We now know at least 133 people were killed, more than 140 injured, when the attackers stormed the building, firing indiscriminately and setting it alight. Eleven people were detained in total and four gunmen were caught whilst heading, allegedly, to Ukraine. Now, the Islamic State says it was behind the attack. Uh, the group later released extremely graphic footage of what happened. Renny and I were talking about it earlier and actually it's just so distressing to see what happened. Putin condemned the massacre, the deadliest in Russia for nearly 20 years. He called it a barbaric terrorist act and repeated repeated earlier accusations that uh, the attackers had tried to escape to Ukraine, trying to implicate Ukraine in this. Kyiv dismissed the claim and said that uh, any idea that they were involved is, and I quote, absurd. Uh, well, joining us now, I'm delighted to, to say, is Duncan Gardam, who's a security analyst and international terrorism expert. Good morning to you. Morning. Really, really good to talk to you. Um, can you tell us a bit more here? I think many of us were, were caught and we were surprised by what happened. Now, Russia had actually been warned by the US security services that an attack was imminent. Yes, the uh, Americans warned Russia through official channels around the beginning of March, March 3rd, uh, that they were getting whispers uh, that uh, they picked up intelligence that there was a potential attack on crowded areas in Moscow. Uh, and they issued that warning to their own citizens around March 7th uh, to be aware um, uh, when gathering in crowded areas, particularly concert halls. Uh, the Russians are saying that, that that was quite a vague warning. The Americans are suggesting that they had uh, more detail than that that they passed on to the Russians. Some action appears to have been taken uh, around a group that was uh, uh, planning to attack a mosque uh, southwest of Moscow. Uh, and also there were some, some raids in Ingushetia, uh, which is uh, in the Caucasus uh, in southern Russia. So uh, it may be that the, 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 the Russians acted on that but didn't find the right cell. Um, it, it, it's difficult to know at the, at the moment. And what do you make of the idea that Putin, even though Islamic State have claimed responsibility, that Putin is trying to push the blame onto Ukraine? I think there was almost an inevitability when this happened that that's exactly what Putin would try to do. The interesting thing is about how measured he's been in that regard. Um, although Medvedev, his uh, former deputy, has been far more outspoken uh, about trying to point the finger uh, at Ukraine and, and seeking revenge. Uh, Putin has necessarily, to some degree, uh, had to accept that these guys are not Ukrainians for a start. Um, and also, blaming Ukraine comes with huge political risk for him because he essentially would be saying, well, this is the blowback for my decision to go into Ukraine. Yeah. So he's essentially done a kind of um if you like a kind of mishmash of the two you know the ukrainians are behind it you know they may have motivated them they may have helped them but obviously it wasn't them that did this and the united states has condemned this heinous act which is what they uh, described it as now the united kingdom has warned putin do not use this terror attack in moscow as an excuse to intensify the war on ukraine so in many ways actually it suits putin to say it was ukraine that then allows him the mandate to continue what he's doing in ukraine also he is spread incredibly thinly is it a case that actually russia has taken its eye off the ball domestically there has always been an islamic threat in russia but obviously all eyes all troops all people focused on ukraine yes I, I, you're, you're absolutely right to, to the degree to which uh, any war sucks in uh, attention when we were in iraq it certainly drew attention uh, away from afghanistan uh, and Putin's probably feeling the same effect to that degree uh, in that all the security apparatus is, is looking uh, at his western border, at that conflict with Ukraine. Meanwhile, uh, he seems to have uh, a terrorist threat, which, according to some reports, is coming out of Tajikistan, which is down uh, in Central Asia, just across the border from Afghanistan. 
uh, and a former Soviet uh, republic. So, it, you know, it's difficult to look in two directions at once uh, and to, to, to uh, dedicate the amount of resources that are needed to do that. But there has been a growing threat from what we call ISIS Khorasan, ISIS in Afghanistan, uh, recently. Uh, and that's not just a threat to Russia. It could potentially come elsewhere. And, and this ISIS-K, my understanding, is an offshoot of IS, and that seeks to establish a Muslim caliphate across Afghanistan, Pakistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and Iran. Is that right? It is, yeah. ISIS-K was formed in 2015, so nearly uh, so nine years ago now, in eastern Afghanistan, uh, and, and is... Um, believe it or not, a more radical offshoot of, of uh, the Taliban or, or uh, and their associates, Al-Qaeda. Uh, they are, uh, in a very ISIS way, uh, I, I know some of your um, uh, listeners and viewers were uh, texting in about Islam as a religion. Uh, these guys are not uh, mainstream Islamic in, in any uh, way, shape or form. They are what we call takfiris and they spend most of their time killing fellow Muslims for not for not following their version of the faith. Uh, and when they're not doing that, they, they do the kind of thing that you've seen in, in, in Moscow. And in terms of that, I, I had no idea that something like 10% of the Russian population is actually Muslim. Yeah, so um, they obviously have a, a big Muslim population down in, in, in Central Asia, and which is kind of that those former Soviet republics are Muslim majority. They're no longer part of Russia, but there are still significant areas along those borders and also quite a significant element of uh, traveling labor that, that moves, uh, uh, you know, into industrial areas around the country. And the Caucasus, which have been their traditionally kind of restive areas, that's Chechnya, Ingushetia, Dagestan, those areas which are down towards Georgia as well, which are Muslim majority. And, and uh, I was going to mention the labor because obviously they're conscripting all the young men to go and fight uh, for Russia. So therefore they have to rely on imported labor. Yes. Uh, it's it's an important part of uh, their economy to man those factories while uh, people are you know but they have also had to step up industrial production enormously to to cope with this effort and so any kind of uh, clampdown uh, or or restriction on movements uh, of this minority could cause real economic problems for Putin. So he's in a dilemma there. Who exactly is he going to go after, especially if these turn out to be Tajiks rather than from the Caucasus, uh, where, which is a completely different area and region of, uh, of that, that he'd be having to look at. So, so how much trouble is Putin in? Because he's trying to whip up some sort of hysteria against the United States, saying the warning was too vague, they didn't give us the information, it was Ukraine, we need to focus there. But actually, he's in trouble, isn't he, over this? Well, I d I'm not sure he is in any greater sense than anybody else is. We've all been victims of these attacks. We've seen very, very similar attacks in, in Paris in 2015, in Mumbai, India in 2008. Um, uh, and we've had our own problems in the UK uh, on a smaller scale in, in London and Manchester. So, you know, does that actually uh, cause an existential threat to your government? Well, we as democratic governments have been able to, to withstand these. Uh, and I would have thought Putin, uh, as an um, autocrat, would be able to do so it more robustly probably than we can. Can I, can I just ask you about an article in The Telegraph this morning? This is uh, about the review by Sarah Khan, the government's advisor on social cohesion. She talks about the fact that we're living in this country in a very fragmented society where people don't talk to each other. We're in sinecures. We're in these different silos that actually, and I'll go back to that expression that was used, that multiculturalism has failed. How dangerous is uh, is the United Kingdom? What is the level of terror threat, do you think? Let me ask you that question. How worried are you about global terror reaching the United Kingdom shores? Well, um, the, the threat is much more complicated now than it, than it was when ISIS was at its peak. So the destruction of ISIS has really taken away a, a large impetus from those who 
felt uh, that the world was about to end and that they needed to prove their loyalty to this extremist uh, cult. Uh, luckily, the world didn't end and ISIS uh, were largely destroyed in, in, their, in, in the centre of their... Um, in their capitals in Raqqa and Mosul, in Iraq and, uh, um, and Syria. So that obviously has taken away a huge threat, Al-Qaeda before it was destroyed. So, so the, the lack of that impetus uh, is definitely making us safer. Um, there, is, there are still threats and uh, inspiration. I know a lot of people are talking about Hamas and the um, mm. marches through central London. It's quite important that we're aware that Hamas does not inspire attacks, it does not encourage attacks abroad. It's not like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. It doesn't go out and say, yes, go and attack the West. Uh, that's not to say that people uh, don't decide to do it on their own because mm -hmm. they're upset about what's happening in, in, in Gaza and Israel. Um, but uh, Hamas is not the organization that's going to encourage that. So th again, that's a, that's a protective factor. The, the world of terrorism is far more complicated now. A lot of the individuals I'm seeing are, are people in their bedrooms, really, who sit uh, staring at their screens, uh, playing computer games, uh, messaging each other over encrypted apps. And an awful lot of them are young white men uh, who then go on to buy weapons uh, and talk about uh, recreating a Nazi state in, in the UK. So that... It demonstrates, I think, that al although there is still a big Islamist threat, and we know uh, about that, that the threat is far more diverse and that there are young individuals buying weapons and they're not necessarily Muslim, I'm afraid. Duncan, really good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. That's Duncan Gardner, who is a security analyst and international terrorism expert. Time